Indonesian airline Suzy Air perform a vital service connecting the remote communities in the mountainous province of Papua. But the flying here is some of the most testing and dangerous in the world. Only Suzy Air's most experienced pilots are allowed to tackle these deadly skies. Let us hope potentially pull the airplane apart. Doesn't matter how good you think you are. Wind will get you, something will get you. 34-year-old Matt Dearden's former career in IT could not be further from his experiences in Papua. Back in UK, it was uh, all looking rosy, you know. It was uh, pretty well paid, a couple of cars, a flat in Bristol. It was uh, on paper looking pretty sweet, but yeah, I just, I just wasn't happy with it. It was mundane, and I figured this is uh, maybe not what I want to do for the rest of my life. At the age of 30 and with minimal flying experience, Matt took a huge gamble and left behind the stable life he had built in the UK. They gave me 10 days notice, so it was a 10-day blitz to try and get everything sorted out, pack my life into a suitcase, and head out to Indonesia. The first night was a sort of a sleepless one, really, just mulling everything over. God, what have I done? You know, packed in everything back home. This is just going to be a massive mistake, and I'm going to have to borrow some money for a flight back home. <laughs> Matt's delivering rice and cooking materials from his base in Tamika to the remote village of Taput, 3,000 meters up in the mountains. For most of the tribal peoples of Papua, contact with the outside world was only made in the 1950s, and the majority of them still live very traditional lives. Many of the locals here, a lot of them haven't even been in an airplane. I mean, some of them just sit on the floor, they sit on each other. So, you know, you get them in a seat, and then you show them how to use a seat belt, how to open it again. It's uh, looking pretty windy out there as well. It's uh, certainly picking up down here and just looking out on the ridges uh, in the distance there are actually the clouds building, so I suspect it's going to be uh, a bit of a bumpy one. The high terrain surrounding Tuput is notorious for causing turbulence, and strong winds on the final approach can make landings treacherous. Hi, Victor, 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 Tribal people are not frequent flyers, and mountain captains don't have the luxury of a stewardess or even a co-pilot if any of them are thrown into panic by the experience of being 10,000 feet off the ground. Passengers are mixed. Some of them just think it's fun, and they're sort of whooping and hollering and kind of thinking it's like a roller coaster. Uh, some of them, it's uh, a little bit scary for them. The weather on the journey is soon bad enough to worry Matt, let alone his nervous passengers. As you can see already, there's a lot of cumulus clouds building up. We don't want to be flying in those things. We want to get those ones a uh, wide berth, certainly in a small airplane like this. Cumulus clouds can build into thunderstorms, which can be incredibly dangerous to small planes like these single-engine porters. Certainly, uh, it's happened before. Wings have come off, that sort of thing. It's the way it goes out here. Papa takes no prisoners. We'll see how it goes. Fingers crossed it's not too bad. As he nears his destination, Matt finds himself being thrown around. <laughs> Turbulence is the number one cause of serious injury in planes, and has even led to the death of passengers thrown around by its force. got through the turbulence, Matt now has to worry about landing safely. I can see we've got a hell of a cross one, actually. To fight the strong crosswind, Matt is forced into a side-on crabbing approach. If he doesn't straighten up at the exact point of landing, he could run off the side of the runway. Matt's steady hand gets the terrified passengers safely onto the ground. I'm with happiness. I 
I guess that was a little bit scary for that, but uh, they should just be happy to be on the ground, really. With their ordeal over, the Dani women are reunited with their loved ones. Still at the very beginning of his career, rookie co-pilot Nick has so far only made one rather bumpy passenger flight with Susie Air. The pressure is on for him to show a marked improvement. On his second flight, he's being mentored by Captain Dave Burns. Nicholas Holmes. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Oh my God, your surname's Holmes and you remind me just like Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch is a knob. <laughs> For the return leg, Nick will be taking the controls. I've just heard like the landings might be an issue, which is, which is pretty much the, uh, <laughs> the most important part, but we, we've, we've got a game sorted. We need him up to speed. So, that's the aim of the game today. Oh, ready as I'll ever be. No big deal. You know? <laughs> well, I say that now. <laughs> but Nick's flying skills are about to come under intense scrutiny. You stop my umbrella? <laughs> a VIP and his entourage are unexpectedly joining the flight. How are you? Fine. He's a special envoy to the Indonesian president, the most powerful man in the country. If the pilot is a, a white man, oh, they, are, they, are, they really, really trust the pilot. <laughs> Dave suddenly realizes their trusting passenger is a personal friend of their feared boss, Susie. All right, we've got, we've got to be, uh, we've got to be good on this because of this guy. Oh, this, this guy, you know, Susie, I know who he is now. Dave doesn't want to do anything to upset boss Susie, so he'll be keeping a very close eye on Nick. He's had pressure on to Nick. He's going to make it as comfortable as possible, because otherwise this guy will tell Susie and he'll get fired. <laughs> oh, no pressure or anything. No pressure or anything. Traffic, traffic. It's OK, continue to just police helicopter yeah. on the right there. Keen to keep Susie's business contact, the special envoy, happy, Dave offers Nick as much advice as possible. Because we're quite heavy on the back, because it wants to flare, just don't, just push it over forward and just land. And just maintain 85. <laughs> He's happy with it? That's good. A little bit up and down. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. The landing wasn't the prettiest, but uh, everything else is okay. And the landing, I can always make that better. He, he was absolutely fine, so I, I've been with much worse. Computer programmer Matt Dearden jacked in his job four years ago to become a mountain pilot in one of the most remote regions of the world. Once he started flying out here, his priorities shifted dramatically. I came out to Indonesia with aspirations, as most pilots do, to get some hours up and then head back to Europe and go flying for one of the airlines there. But, you know, within a few months of being out here, I thought, this is way more interesting than, like, being back in Europe. Why would I want to go back and do that, you know, when I can have this adventure lifestyle out here? His job delivering supplies to cut off communities 
provides him with an opportunity to see a way of life few people get the chance to experience. This is the last frontier. Here I am in the absolute wilderness. You know, you've got naked guys walking around with penis sheaths and, and spears and bows and arrows. And it was like, hell yeah, <laughs> I want a piece of this action. Today, he's delivering supplies to Tuput. The village of around 50 Dani people survives on hunting and highland farming. So these irregular supply drops are an important supplement. Just kind of helping the people develop out here, it's, it's, it's hugely satisfying being able to do that. So, mungkin minggu depan ada terpanar tangan lagi. Sekarang kira kau semuanya charter sekarang. The guys asking me when we're going to come back again. I don't know at the moment, so I just said to him, maybe next week, maybe next month. And he's like, okay, we'll uh, we'll wait for you to come back. Matt's keen interest in the tribal people means he's happy to accept an invite to the local village. For his job, Matt has learned Bahasa, the national language. But there are 300 languages spoken amongst the tribes of Papua. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, we're not Ah, tira papa. Did you papa? Oh, wow. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, for small people, this place. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Salamat, sorry, Samoya. Sorry. Wow, fabulous, yeah. Very primitive life. It's, <laughs> you know, they got the fire here. They got a little bit of vegetables hanging up over there. And uh, that's about it, eh? Nice Sky TV, yeah. So, masak di atas apa? Ya, ini biasa taruh belanga pakai ini. Ini taruh belanga baru masak. Masak apa? Masak ubi, sayur, nasi. This is the first time I've actually gone in one of these little huts. You know, I fly over them all the time. So, yeah, this is awesome to actually to come and meet some of the people and actually check out how they live. It's Amazing. Yeah, he's just saying that uh, I'm actually the first uh, white person who's actually uh, ever come into their village and into one of their little huts here. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty cool privilege. For me, the ultimate kick flying in Papua is going to kind of new new places that I've not been to before. I, I love doing that. I love just finding somewhere new. <laughs> Having finished a week's flying, Captain Dave Burns heads out to join some other Suzy Air staff. He's been waiting patiently to hear news about the job he went for as base manager. Um, I haven't been offered the base manager's job, but I've been offered the deputy base manager's job. I think Susie likes my feistiness for some reason. She, she likes the fact that how I was nearly fired nine months ago, and somehow we've just had a complete turnaround. <laughs> Nick's also celebrating. He's now well on the way to being accepted as a fully-fledged Susie Air pilot but he's still coming to terms with taking passengers' lives into his hands. Actually flying passengers is interesting. I think it actually negatively affects my flying, you know? It's that little extra bit of pressure. But uh, it can only get better. I don't think it can get much worse anyway. <laughs> In Papua, pilots often find themselves delivering essential yet highly flammable fuel supplies. And in Timaka, Papua, mountain pilot Matt's cargo is likely to cause a problem if there's a bumpy landing. Fuel drums, these are full of diesel. They uh, count as a dangerous good. So uh, we have to actually have an extra, extra bit of paperwork for this one. To help Indonesia's most remote communities become less isolated, some roads have been built between them. But the roads are useless if there isn't fuel to power the vehicles. You want to be absolutely sure the, uh, the cap is all on there secure. You get a bit of fuel leaking out, and that's not a pleasant thing at all. Um, you want to have the uh, windows all open and even go on the oxygen if you need to. Um, you know, fumes in the cabin, really, really not good. Passing out from the fumes is not the only concern. Because of the air pressure changes, what happens is they uh, slowly expand, and as they expand, 
you get uh, the drum will sort of make a hell of a bang. Uh, the first time you fly with them is very unnerving. to the Moni village of Bilai, 25 miles from Matt's base. The strip at this village was the site of a crash landing two years ago. Matt does a fly pass to check the landing strip is clear to avoid making the same mistake, especially loaded with barrels of diesel. Right, there's a lot of people on the left here in Bilai. I can actually see them walking down the airstrip. Just come in a little bit and let them know we're here. Oh, uh, bloody hundreds of them. People on the airstrip is not something you want at all. Um, they are heading a person with an aircraft, and potentially obviously it'll kill the person, but uh, potentially cause the aircraft to lose control as well. Sometimes they just don't learn, you know. Aircraft of people are not safe. You know, they've got to keep out the way. Okay, it looks nice and clear now, they've actually moved off to the side. Just land past those guys. Matt's careful landing means he and the much needed fuel have both arrived safely. Yeah, health and safety would love this. With the diesel unloaded, Matt takes the opportunity to investigate an all too real reminder of what happens when things go wrong. This plane may be worth millions of pounds, but it was a write-off when it crash landed here and it was left to rot on the strip. This is what's left of the fuselage of this aircraft. Um, there's no instruments left and no seats. Most of the panels are missing, the engine's gone. All the wheels, undercarriage, it's all, oh yeah, it's all gone. You know, on top of this would have been a, a sort of an upper section, um, which I think I caught an eye of over there somewhere. I think they're using it for something else. Given the village's lack of resources, it didn't take long for the crashed plane to be put to good use. This is the top of the uh, fuselage here. Painted a rather fetching green by the looks of it. A little help for his, uh, for his scooter there. Oh wow, yeah, so these are the, uh, these are the wings of the aircraft. Um, obviously now, the walls of this little hut. You're never gonna use them as an aircraft wing again, so yeah, might as well be the wall of the house. <laughs> so one minute this thing's flying the skies of Papua, you know, delivering whatever it needs to. Next minute it's uh, the garage with someone's moped. <laughs> Funny old world. had four years to adjust from working in IT to flying in Indonesia, and the experience has completely changed the way he sees himself. I really do feel like I'm, I'm a different person. It's, it's basically, you know, I've gone from a normal kind of bloke, just doing a normal kind of job back in a normal country, and now I'm, I guess, slightly crazy bloke doing a crazy job in a pretty crazy country. And mountain pilot Matt couldn't be happier with the change search for the perfect job is over. Papua is just the last frontier. It's, it's the ultimate adventure, really. I don't want to fly 737 for Ryanair or an Airbus for EasyJet or whatever. This is proper flying. This is the real deal. This is what I actually want to do with my life. You know, I mean, I'm 34 now, so you start thinking about the future. Could I do this forever? I mean from a fun and like selfish point of view. Yeah, I mean, I probably could, it's, it's awesome.
After getting the thumbs up from boss Susie, Dave is settling into his new job as deputy base manager. This is our ticketing department. Yes. Busy at all times. <laughs> Good. That's what we want. I think I base my management style on Richard Branson. He's very relaxed. He has lots of different ideas, but most importantly, he's a go-getter. And I hear he's a very good communicator. Have we made much money today? <laughs> that means no. He's hoping that his new position will take him a step closer to moving back to Britain for his dream job as a jet pilot. I fire CVs to companies that um, operate big jet aircraft. So here we've got everything from Aer Lingus, we've got Cathay Pacific, Dragon Air in Hong Kong, Emirates, Etihad, uh, all, all. Literally, I've covered a lot there, a lot. But he has never got past the interview, and his dream seems as far away as ever. It's, it's a bit disheartening when you send them all out and you don't really hear stuff back, but there's just so many pilots out there that need jobs, so you've just got to never give up. Never, ever give up. It's still a very long way from me being home. A very, very long way. Next time. Look at the speed of that. Pilots deal with the terrors of rush hour in Papua. Traffic, traffic. Watch out for this guy. And an election dispute gets out of hand. We gotta get out of here. Once there's blood, that's it. Oh, oh, oh.